so I have a tendency to, I, I really love data. And I think there's a, a misconception about organization building and using data, manipulating data, and using data to, to set goals, and somehow they can't live in the same universe. One is absolutely dependent on the other. And you can have a very empowering, respectful, and inclusive organization that is 100% driven by data. And, and, and no one should feel like you can't. Um, so I, it's just incredibly important. And it's something that in 2008, people often talk about our grassroots, right? All the volunteers that we had. We had about 1.2 million volunteers across the country in 2008. And they often talk about our online activ activities. You know, the hundreds of millions of dollars we raised, uh, you know, the big email list, et cetera, et cetera. But no one talks about the way that we use data. And data hygiene, the integrity of data, uh, is probably the most important thing that you can provide uh, your campaign, your party, or your movement. And you have to be absolutely disciplined about it. If you have bad data, everything you do after that uh, is, is less. Uh, you need the integrity of your data to be pristine. It is something that we're extremely, extremely zealous about. So again, this is for campaigns in America, but I, I, I do think that some of this is transferable or applicable to some of the conversations that we're having here. First is that it's important to build an early understanding of the electorate, right? So by that, we look at the population analysis, the demographics, look at previous turnouts. Uh, so in 2010, we looked at 2006 turnout. It was 62% of the population. Take 62%, multiply it by the current population, and have a, a relatively decent sense of what turnout should be. Um, two is we would establish state vote goals or you could establish uh, congressional district vote goals, or you could establish precinct, which is our most small, you know, our most granular uh, voting electorate. Um, and we did that in 2008. We had goals for everything. Our volunteers knew what those goals were, and we held ourselves accountable to those goals. But what percent of total turnout does our, cap our candidate need to capture to be successful? You know, what's 50 plus 1%? And then finally, how do we build a win strategy registration, persuade, and then turn out voters so that, one, our candidate is successful, but two, our volunteers, our team leaders, have a very, very detailed understanding of what's expected of them, uh, but also, uh, you know, what each day when they come to the office and they register two or three people or they talk to 10 or 15 folks on the phone, how does that add up to 50 plus one? And we try to be as transparent about that as possible. Uh, it's an incredibly empowering but also it's probably the best thing that we can do to get folks invested. If folks see instant gratification on the work that they're doing, uh, they're, they're much more likely to come in the office uh, and keep volunteering. Okay, so bear with me, I know this one's <laughs> a little complex. So when you look at a state, you look at a congressional district, you look at a precinct, uh, this is how we broke it down. You had your voting eligible population. So that's basically everyone that's 18 years and older who could register to vote, but either has or has not, right? So then you'd have either unregistered voters or registered voters. And then underneath those unregistered voters, you had unregistered Democrats and unregistered non-Democrats, or, or unregistered supporters or unregistered non-supporters. So we as a campaign don't wanna spend a second of our time talking to an unregistered non-supporter, right? All we wanna do is try to register Democrats. Uh, and then if you look under the registered voters, you have both Democrats, nonpartisan voters, or independents, and GOP. Under Democrats, we have what we call sporadic voting Democrats, and then likely voting Democrats. Now, voting is a habit-forming process, right, for us anyway. And, you know, if you vote in two or three elections in a row, no matter what I do as a campaign person, you're going to vote. You're going to find where your polling location is, you're going to show up and vote because you self-identify as a voter. But let's say that you vote only in presidential years, but, non, uh, but you don't vote in non-presidential years. Or you voted in one of the last three general elections, or two of the last three. You're a sporadic voter, and it's important for us as a campaign to make sure that we reach out and touch you uh, so that you do, in fact, vote. And what we found through data and through the analytics that we did afterwards is that if you, uh, uh, and, and we, we had test groups, we, I mean, we, we did tons of experiments, but if you had a friend or a neighbor reach out and touch you, and you were a sporadic voter, the likelihood of participation 
with that sporadic Democrat increased by five to eight percent. So you as a candidate, let's say you know, you're expecting 100,000 people to turn out and vote on election day, and I talk to 200,000 uh, you know, 100, sporadic voting Democrats, I would then say I've directly impacted 5,000 votes. That's a big deal, right? And we wanted to try to make sure that our volunteers understood that. And then uh, the other bucket of voters that we talked to were persuasion targets. And again, what we were able to find during both the primary and the general election is that uh, message is important, it's incredibly important, but so is the messenger. Having a friend or a neighbor, somebody that has a pre-existing relationship with that person uh, prior to politics, prior to this campaign, is the most uh, influential, influential uh, uh, validator our campaign would have. Uh, and again, you could look at it and you'd see a 5 to 8% jump in likelihood of supporting then-Senator Obama because of that conversation. And we wanted to celebrate and reward that. Uh, and we did. It was also interesting, uh, David Plouffe, who is the campaign manager, talks about this all the time, but we had folks who did persuasion on the clock, meaning that like when they came into the office, they got their walk packets, they went out, knocked on doors, and made telephone calls, et cetera, et cetera. But then also you had off the clock persuasion, where they were just picking up kids at the church or the PTA meeting or meeting some friends at a grocery store or going, you know, wherever it is, and just generally engaging in a conversation. Uh, and you can't necessarily measure that, but we know it happened, and we think it was incredibly important for us to be successful. I know this is, this is a little confusing, too, and it's a little boisterous, too. A good campaign, good institutions, that's us. You know, we're the best. But um, basically how to look at this is you have a good campaign, right? So somebody who generates a lot of enthusiasm, um, who, who's able to get lots of folks in the door, uh, lots of folks self-selecting to be a part of that campaign, uh, enterprise, but then you have a poor institution, meaning that you have a, a bad voter management uh, information system. We have what we call the voter activation network, something that Tom, when he was at the D, uh, DNC, helped uh, uh, nationalize. But, you know, we have very detailed records on voters all across the country. We know what issues they care about. We know what their vote history is. We know how they have identified for previous Democratic or Republican candidates. All that helps us identify who's a likely supporter and who isn't, who is a likely voter and who isn't. Uh, it's incredibly important, and it's, it's something that we spend millions of dollars on. The integrity of that data is the foundation for everything that we do. I, I just I can't stress that enough. And now, how do you build an organization to achieve those goals? So you look at the data, you know what your, your win number is, what's 50 plus 1%, you have a good strategy based off of those numbers. So how do you build an organization to go out there and achieve those goals? This was uh, Obama for America's field organizers uh, organization. And this is what it looked like. And the ratio here is incredibly important. We would have an organizer, field organizer, so that's a paid staffer, and then they would recruit team leaders. Team leaders are basically super volunteers, folks who are very, very committed, uh, have proven themselves to be effective and efficient leaders, have taken a test, usually it's twice, they don't know it, uh, but we ask them to put on an event and then we judge how they did. Um, you have what we call team members. So you might have the team leader, uh, but then you'd have your canvas captain or your canvas leader. You'd have your phone bank leader. You'd have your data leader. And basically these folks then each have their own role and know exactly what they need to do and then underneath that, you would have your volunteers. You know, the person who'd show up at the office 10 o'clock Saturday morning and say, hey, is there a walk packet? Well, the Canvas team leader would have all the walk packets ready to go, provide them to lit, do the training, and get them out the door. The ratio is important is because we found that basically between five to 10 is sort of the range that you want as far as proper management you know, ratio. If it's less than that, then it's just being redundant and you don't need a supervisor. If it's more than that, it's just too much. Uh, so, you know, between five and ten is sort of the, the optimal number. So what makes team leaders or neighborhood teams effective? First, it relies on credible leaders, respected in their communities. So these are the folks who are going to act as the validators in their community. You know, what you want, <laughs> this, is, this is really important, you don't necessarily want the person who volunteers to be the team leader, right? This has to be merit-based, and that's something that I'll talk about at the end. But if it's not merit-based, then you failed your organization. 
And there's a lot of people who've been the team leader or the precinct captain or the precinct committee person for decades. And uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they work, right? Does everyone understand what I'm saying on that? Voters trust their neighbors more than they trust campaign staffers. I'm a seriously very nice guy. I'm very honest, I think. But if I go to somebody who I don't have, I don't know outside of the conversation or the transaction we're happening at the door, of course I'm not going to be as influential to them. But the person who drops her kids off every other Saturday at swimming class, you know, if you're willing to trust your kids with somebody, obviously you're willing to have a discussion with them about politics. You might not necessarily change your mind, but that inroad is so much more important than anything that a paid staff can do.